Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Michael and Friends. And today I'm extremely pleased to welcome young Finnish conductor Klaus Meckele. To only call you a conductor is wrong because you're also a great cellist and you are a competitor of mine. You are festival director, um, also in, in, since very young years of the Turku Festival. Um, what uh, is the most important thing for you right now? I mean, that may be a rhetoric question, but still an interesting question. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Michael. And nice to see you. Nice to see you over Zoom also. Um, well, I mean, for me, the most important thing is always what I do the week, uh, what I'm doing now. And now I'm in Oslo uh, with one of my orchestras, the Oslo Philharmonic, and we're doing Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, which is one of these pieces which I always wanted to conduct. Uh, that was a little kind of pandemic project of mine. Uh, so I decided, okay, now since I have a lot of time, you know, in the beginning of pandemic, everything stopped them. I suddenly had months and months of free time. And then I thought, okay, now I finally start tackling this piece because it's very, very complicated. And now it's finally the week when I'm when I'm doing it. And it, I must say it feels very, very special. But I can't wait also to come to Lucerne now with the, with the same orchestra uh, in August. Yeah, but you you were trained as a cellist first. As a chamber musician, you come from a very musical family. Was there a lot of pressure on you to become a really leading musician, conductor or cellist? I must say I was very, very fortunate because my parents, uh, my dad's a cellist and my mother is a pianist and kind of everybody in the family plays something. My dad is a viola player. And, uh, my, my, my grandfather is a viola player. Um, but they were always, always very encouraging, but never pushing. And I think that was very good for me because I could somehow find my own thing in a way. And I, I could feel very strong about my own thing. And then if I needed help, I remember if I needed some help with fingering in the cello or something, I could ask my dad. But they were very nice. And also Finland was a very, very comfortable surrounding to grow up in a way, musically also. We had very good education. We had especially very good teachers. Um, Jorma Panola was my conducting teacher, you know, the great pedagogue who is still alive, 93, and teaches every week, apparently. Um, and I got very good uh, education, which was always emphasizing the fact that, that you know, music is, is a lifelong learning process. And that we should always have a certain kind of humility in front of the music and trust uh, the people we work with in a way. Um, and it wasn't too too much kind of saying that you are the person who can do things, but rather that remember that you can do things with the people around you and yourself is, is okay, but you need to really figure out how to work with people, the other people. And I thought that was a really nice thing, especially from such an unsocial country like Finland where no one speaks to anyone. Is that so? Is yeah, that we're... <laughs> I remember my teacher, Jorma Panola, also saying, saying a few words always, just maybe three, four words and then stopping and then again. Mm -hmm. And that was it. But but it all came from a good good place. <laughs> yeah, it was actually like my violin teacher, Ivan Galamian in New York. Oh, yeah. He said, you have to yeah. play slower or you have to play fast. And that was it. And then in the, <laughs> yeah. in the course of the lesson, he smoked about 10 cigarettes, which was <laughs> He, he got the message and obviously you have uh, making one of the most interesting uh, artistic careers today um, at a very young age in 2017 you gave your debut with uh, Stockholm I believe and, and ever since you have grown and grown and today you are the uh, music director of two orchestra of the Oslo Philharmonic and also of the Orchestra de Paris and in 27 you will start your work as the music director of the Concertgebouw Orchestra Amsterdam. That's a very, very fast track for you. And how do you deal with the pressure and, and the demands and, and the expectations that you that come closer to you now? Yeah, I mean, I must say, I'm very lucky because I work with people I really want to work with. Uh, and that's for me the best thing. Why I wanted to commit to so many orchestras was actually a very... Uh, which was a decision of mine um, because, you know, I, of course, a conductor, we, we sell weeks, as you know, and, and, and one week there, another week there. And, and then I found this, this kind of partners in crime for me, these, these orchestras, first Oslo and then Paris and now Concertgebouw, you know, where I felt that, you know, I get much deeper um, because the, the, the people I work with are, you know, somehow we connect 
in a more special way. And, and when you work with the same people again and again and again, you know, you can cut all the kind of like, you know, uh, nonsense, mm -hmm. but you can go always directly to the point. And that's something which I really, really like. And of course, when you're a music director or chief conductor, you also get to conduct different pieces. Because if you're a guest conductor, you're always given the, some pieces, but then when a music director, you really can choose what you play and you can shape a profile. And I also really much like the... The, the the job of a, of a music director or chief conductor in a way that you know it of course has the artistic responsibility but in many ways also a sort of personal side of it you know I know that my musicians quite well and sometimes we go out for a beer or something like this and and it's and it's always really really nice to to feel that you know you are there together instead of because conducting can also be quite a lonely sport mm -hmm. yeah musicianship as as a whole is can be quite lonely. But um, I noticed that when we met in Vienna that you're very social and very uh, interested who you're talking to and what the person is doing. And uh, um, after, uh, I remember a very, very memorable concert of the third and fifth symphony of Jean Sibelius with the Oslo Philharmonic at the concert house. And you had just given the complete cycle there. And I mean, I find, you know, uh, this probably to be the most difficult cycle to do the old Sibelius symphonies, because they're in a world by themselves, not all of them very accessible as music, and to bring it closer to an audience and to integrate it with the orchestra, quite an achievement, I felt. Well, you think you're so sweet, and, and thank you again for coming to the concert. It was really nice that, that you took the time, and, and that was a very special um, thing for us, to me and the orchestra, the Oslo Orchestra because we had recorded the symphonies during the pandemic. And as you said, Sibelius' symphonies, they are such, in a way, they're, they're the most original symphonies ever written in a way, because they don't seem to really come from, from a clear line of tradition or anything, but they, he speaks his completely own language, which, which takes some time to kind of <laughs> settle it in, uh, both for the performers, but then also for the audience. Um, and I remember that was a very special thing that, that the Wiener Concert House and Matthias Naske and Rico uh, then gave us the trust and said, okay, you can do the complete symphonies and engage us when we were, you know, in a very early stage of our relationship. But of mm -hmm. course, now we are very much looking forward to playing the seventh in Lutzen because mm -hmm. that's in a way the seventh symphony is, is in a way the crown, the, the, great, the greatest achievement of Sibelius in a way. And the symphonic structure is a symphony in one movement and he has everything in 20 minutes what you know, Mahler took one and a half hours to say in the third symphony of his. And I think you're bringing a totally outstanding program to us, uh, especially on the first night also, but also on the second night with uh, Gustav Mahler's symphony number four, which fits perfectly to our theme of paradise, um, you know, the joy of the heavenly life. And, and then you go into Wagner's Vorspiel und Liebestod, Tristan, uh, and, and then uh, at the end, John Sibelius, uh, Symphony Number no. Seven in, in C Major. How did you come about this program? How does it re How do the pieces relate to one another? I love when I heard about the theme, the, the paradise, and the first thought was like Mother Four, <laughs> and then I was very glad that it wasn't taken yet, <laughs> and, and we got it. Uh, so, in a way, those three pieces, they we have three different. Um, a resurrections in a way or, or or resignings of of you know to something greater um and of course Mahler 4 has some of the most beautiful endings which just sort of goes up in the air and of course last moment we have the, the beautiful soprano melody and, and and song and then it just sort of slowly slowly goes away and it's beautiful then um the Wagner Prelude and Liebestod, of course, it's a much more existential struggle, which in a way we always have in Mother too, this, this tension and, and this, this expressionist spirit. Um, and then in the Sibelius Symphony, it's a mixture of them both, because we hear, I mean, Sibelius was really fighting with tonality. We hear this, this tension between the, the, the harmony and, and, and almost breaking out from tonality, but still keeping. And it's, a, it's the most expressionistic music one can have, but... It's, it's composed by a man who has seen everything and has experienced everything. So there's a certain kind of clarity and, and purity of expression, which is another sort of variation. So we have three pieces which more or less touch the same subject, but with their own very special ways. Yeah, it's a fascinating program. And the second one, of course, 
with the Tchaikovsky Sturm Overture, then the two piano concertos by Ravel, and um, reaching out again into the theme of, uh, you know, uh, heavenly life or of ecstasy uh, with uh, Scriabin's poem de l'Extase. Have you done that a lot? Yes, and that's a beautiful piece. And that's also one of the most rewarding pieces to conduct because when you conduct the Scriabin Extase, you really feel that, that uh, the, the music is, is happening more spontaneously uh, between you and the orchestra than almost with any other piece. Because that's a piece where you really everyone, because the way how it's written, it's written with such imagination. And also it's, it's quite an unusual piece all in all. Uh, and it's a lot about building things. And there are some of these developments. And of course, at the end, the reward of, of, of the great ending, which is one of the most spectacular endings of any music. And uh, it's, it, it's a really rewarding piece. It, it, it has so many smells. It has so many uh, layers of, 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 of poetic uh, elements. And of course, then when you put it together with the, with the, with the Ravel, uh, the, the concertos, it's, it's in many ways, it, it speaks, again, something in the same language, it, 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 but it's in still in different expression. That I find interesting, that we, we find pieces which, which feel that they're as if they are linked, but, but after all, they, they, they just showcase each of the composer's own personalities, but mm. it's something in, in comparison. Are you doing a lot of Scriabin? Scriabin is some... Or... Yes, I mean, Scriabin is a composer which I've both fought... Uh, first for and then against um, because you know for me um, Scrabin is absolutely one of the great composers I both love conducting Scrabin but then also I have to be very careful which pieces I do because the, the poem Delex Tass for me is, is absolute masterpiece and, and I really feel wonderfully comfortable with it but it's also music which is the, the, the harmonic language is, is such chromatic it has such chromatic tension but sometimes for me, when I when I uh, studied some of the other pieces, I start feeling very dizzy. Like, okay, now I I need to get some fresh air because it's so dense and it's so so so. So for me, you know, scrubbing has to come at the right time, and then I'm ready to give it the absolute absolute uh, all. Yeah, well, we are really tremendously looking forward to to the two concerts on the 24 and 25 of August. Uh, this summer, it's going to be your debut, but we have many plans in the future. And also we look forward then, in, I believe it's in 25, when you come with the Concertgebouw, will yeah. also be a historic moment. I mean, the Concertgebouw is one of our uh, biggest partners over the past decades, and um, such a wonderful orchestra with a very unique quality of sound and culture and of, of musicianship. How, how do you feel about the Concertgebouw? Oh, stepping into that. this and legacy now it's, it's it's such a wonderful orchestra and and, and i i really can't wait to come to lutzen also with them because that would be very special and of course they they always value very much coming there so often and um uh, it's an orchestra which is great because they have such tradition and and in a way you know my job then at the end is to preserve some some of it and quite a lot of it and then further develop uh, and it's interesting because the the whole they play in normally the concert about it has such a personal acoustic it has a very strong personality uh, and that shapes the way the orchestra plays a lot in that hall you really need to you need to prioritize the beauty of sound and the quality of sound and if you don't the hall will punch you back immediately uh, so it's a really interesting that's a really shaped the orchestra's sound a lot to be this rich still quite transparent beautiful sound but quite flexible sound um, but it's so wonderful now to come 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 to Lutzen for the first time because you know I, I was once at the festival when I was very very young I came to hear the Haitink masterclass uh, mm -hmm. but I was not participating but I was just listening to it because I was I was too young to participate even and I remember also hearing some orchestra concerts the first ever concert was the LA Philharmonic with Dudamel playing Firebird complete Firebird and La Mer and that was I remember coming to the I didn't even believe that I could get tickets and then I got very nice tickets and with my uh, you know Finnish friend. And we heard that, and then we heard another concert which was absolutely brilliant. John Elliott, John Elliott Gardner conducting the St. John Passion, which is, I think, his 70th birthday concert, or something like this, which is an absolutely beautiful mm -hmm. concert. So now when when I come to perform there, it, it will feel very, very special. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. And um, we wish you a great Misa Solemnis now in Oslo. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Much satisfaction and aspiration. 
And uh, really so much looking forward to seeing you in August. Well, in thank you. And into outstanding performances. Take very good care and um, great success. And we see you soon. Thank you so much, Klaus. Thank you so much. I appreciate bye -bye. it. See you soon. Bye-bye.